Okay. Um, actually, I grew up in Ann Arbor, and I am a member of the silent generation, as you know. Uh, and in the foundation world, we talk about generations a lot, particularly in the family foundation world, and so that's sort of why I'm throwing that in. Yeah. But I have always thought that I was really much more a part of the World War II generation because the World War II started almost right after my eighth birthday. Okay. My father was in a medical unit that the University of Michigan put together. And so <clears throat> they left, and when they left, they got on a train in Ann Arbor, and nobody knew whether the train was going to go east or west, oh where gosh. it was going to go, whether they were going to end up in Europe or Africa or in the Pacific. And they didn't know where their husbands, and in some cases wives, were for probably three weeks until they finally arrived in England. And so <clears throat> that was almost four years of being the oldest child in a single parent family with three younger sisters. And I, th and I think that, and I think that that was, was in many respects transformative. I told a story the other night about when I was 10, my mother took me to New York and we were having dinner with a friend of the family whose, hus whose brother was actually my father's tent mate. And by the, that was when we were just beginning to hear about the Nazi atrocities. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the sister stopped and she said, well, Margaret, you probably don't want me to talk to Ranny about this. And mother said, no, you can say anything you want to in front of Ranny. She needs to know what's going on. Gotcha. And that's just a total attitudinal, you're 10 years old, but you have to be responsible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I think that's one of the things that, made a huge impact on me, mm -hmm. always, as part of that. Which doesn't mean I was ever perfect. Little girls at 10 are bigger than little boys at 10, because also when I was 10, my female classmates and I staged our first sit-down strike. <laughs> this is terrible. We, we had a teacher who was probably very ADD, because she was really a terrible teacher, but she was really into modern dance. And so the girls all had to take modern dance. And the boys got to march twice a week. And we had ROTC drilling right outside the school all the time. The boys got to do that kind of stuff. We had to be flowers unfolding, great, wonderful things like that. And so we staged the sit-down strike. Well, Juliana decided to cry. And so everybody but one other girl and I got up. So she grabbed us and she pulled us up and swatted us. And, <laughs> and that was the end of our strike. So I learned something about the effectiveness of strikes. Yes. <laughs> uh, but that's the kind of little girl I was when I was 10. I mean, I will say one of the things I'm going to do with my trustees when I, I have two new trustees and some new associate trustees coming in a couple of weeks and to talk about, because my mother always told me that when she was growing up, that when they earned any money and she babysat some of the, my cousins who are older than I am, my grandparents' family is almost split in two halves. Mm -hmm. And so my oldest cousin is 93 right now. And then there's one who's probably close to 90. And then I'm the oldest, and that's a little gap in there between us. Uh, but if mother learned, earned any money, one fraction of it had to be reinvested in the Dow Chemical Company. One fraction of it had to go, the same fraction had to go in the church plate. And the third, third part was hers. <laughs> and the funny thing is, and Dottie could t tell you who, who the uh, Rockefeller sister who used to be Chair, chairman of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund was, but she told exactly the same story about that's the way she was brought up. Yeah. I was a political activist yes. before I was. <laughs> oh, before? Okay. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, if, if you take things chronologically, um, it, which is rather strange. And again, it, a lot of this is my mother's influence because when I was. I did not go to the University of Michigan, by the way. I'd had enough after 12 years or however many. Yes. And, and I went to Carleton College in Minnesota. 
and I really was a zoology major. And then I went to Mount Holyoke and did graduate work. And like every other young woman in the 50s, then I got married. Mm -hmm. And my husband was in the Army for three years mm. after we were married. And we were stationed at the Pentagon. Okay. And three years of being a good officer's wife was... <laughs> I really did like the dress blues. Yeah. I thought maybe they were speaking <laughs> well, and the, yeah. uh, No, and the women, you know, yes. you always wore elbow-length gloves when you did anything formal. And, well, and we wore hats. We wore hats and white right. kid gloves yes. for everything we were doing. Oh, different world. And that was that, the way it was in Midland when, I, when we moved here. Okay. And actually, my mother had been on the city council in Ann Arbor when I was on the, in college, and I thought she was absolutely crazy. And I've always laughed about she, John, when John and I were courting, they'd sit and talk politics. And the mother would say, oh, I'm sorry. And she'd leave and go to bed. <laughs> and by then, John said, I have to go to work tomorrow, Randy. <laughs> <laughs> so when we, actually, when we moved to Midland, John, um, it was a depression time at, or recession in 1958. And so Dal wasn't able to give John the job that we thought we had when we were coming. And so he got a job with one of our state sent the state senator from Midland. And the first thing that happened was we came in May, and by midsummer, realizing the Republican Party was not going to give them the kind of financial or other support, that they just didn't have it. And so we all became involved in his campaign. We were the campaign. So, so we began to become involved in, well, first of all, obviously, fundraising because that was the big thing that the party had. But it's just the fact that, that because we were getting involved, we both got involved with the Republican org organizations, not just the party. They used to have a breakfast club that met one Sunday of every month. And they used to have women's clubs. And so, yes. you know, getting involved in all of those things. And then, strangely enough, um, before the 1960 election, 58 election, 50, 50, JFK, uh, yeah, it was a 60 election. Uh, in 59, Dow and the National Chamber of Commerce sponsored an action course in practical politics. And I was very fortunately invited to take the leaders course, which I did. Uh, um, it was it was a fun thing because probably a hundred people ended up in in this community, which at that point in time was probably less than sixty thousand people actually taking the action course in practical politics, wow. learning about what the law is governing politics, and everything else, and actually doing political organization. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. I like organization. <laughs> And, and so I just kept on doing it. And then I had been involved in the Goldwater campaign. And so Ellie called me and said, come on down to Lansing. And she said, as the first woman chair, as soon as she became the chair, she said, I need somebody to do women's activities because there is not a first vice chair to do women's activities. And I want someone who can work with the party women and the women's club women. And would you like to do it? And I said, yes. <laughs> and she said, all right, I think you should take a tour. So she took me to a map and she pointed out, I'd never thought in terms of the whole state, the 10th congressional district at that point in time was big enough. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's what I did. <laughs> and it, the whole idea was training women leaders oh, and man. teaching them what they needed to know to be effective and increase the number of women county and district chairmen. And I love doing it. And then I succeeded Ellie on the national committee that, again, I mean, talk about mentors. <laughs> that when she had gotten fed up with the national committee after two years, she just said, okay, you're running for national committee woman now. <laughs> well, I was elected within the party. But I no, I never ran for public office. I seriously thought about it at one point in time. 
that I really did have. I think about it, less than a year old. <laughs> I was going to ask if that was if that a was three year old. Ask you what was going on at home when you were yeah. traveling all those places that you talked about. Um, well, Peggy says she grew up working in Republican headquarters, <laughs> <laughs> um, and the you know the really interesting thing is that even when I was commuting back and forth to Lansing, I would be home by dinner time, and I had I actually had some good help uh, because uh, this is another one of those things that we grew up believing that families sit down and eat dinner together every night and our family sat down and ate dinner together every night <coughs> and obviously if I was gone for five days I wasn't sitting down but John and the kids were or if John was gone mm -hmm. that we sat down at the dining room table yes. and we had dinner mm -hmm. actually I stayed I think I I stayed on the National Committee through the first Reagan administration, so it was until 1984. But at the same time, we started CMF in the early 70s, late 60s, early, well, early 70s, actually. And so, and in the early 60s, my mother started the Towsley Foundation, I think in 1957 or 58. And my my next three sisters and I all went on as trustees in 62. Okay. And then my mother was a trustee of the Dow Foundation and she hated commuting to Midland. And so <laughs> she finally, after I'd had one year experience on the Towsley Foundation, suggested strongly that I should become a trustee of the Dow Foundation at the same time. And so basically, Actually, I was in there as essentially, well, I had 10 years as a trustee before, before CMF, but, but being involved in two family foundations. Mm -hmm. And um, really, it, in both cases, I'll really taking things very seriously, neither one was a sta what we call staffed foundation. Um, we had clerical help, but that, that was it that we really and truly, and that has been our tradition. I brought the first executive director into the Dow Foundation six years ago. There's no rational thought involved. This is our responsibility. We were given the privilege of having this huge foundation, and it's our responsibility to make sure it works right. And, and yeah, well, or a fraction of, because but, but, but no, the same response, that sense it, of it, responsibility. it's responsibility, and, and this is our it is our privilege, and we really serve it. It's hard for trustees to understand. We really serve it the privilege of the Congress, as a matter of fact. And I think that this really is true of many of us who've been involved for a long, long time that we recognize the fact that we have a very great privilege. And this is true of some of the other people who are not family members, but who are leaders in the independent foundations, that it's a privilege and it's also a tremendous responsibility. And no one else is going to. And the other thing, it is not a substitute for our personal philanthropy. This is, this, this is fun, it's exciting. You meet so many absolutely wonderful people with wonderful ideas. And sometimes they really do have the capacity to carry them out and sometimes they don't. And you can be helpful. And I think we particularly at the Dow Foundation, well, all of the bigger foundations, <clears throat> our role is not just giving money. We do a lot more. We, we do a lot of convening and facilitating. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't like people trying to reinvent the same wheel all the time. And so the more I know, the more probably the more frequently I say, do you know so-and-so who's trying to do the same thing? Would you like to talk to them? Maybe you should get together. <laughs> <laughs>